trying to be more conscious of uh, of making sure that projects are the right fit in terms of what you can offer i think is 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 uh, an interesting focus Business of Architecture, episode 249. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you haven't already, get free instant access to the four-part architecture firm Profit Map video by going to freearchitectgift.com. Enter your best email address on that page, and you'll get instant access. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core, the all-in-one firm management software. Core helps you manage projects and your finances to create a profitable and impactful firm. Get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Today, Ryan Willard takes the mic and interviews architect Oliver Cook. Oliver Cook is co-founder of Cook Fawcett, a UK-based firm focused on cultural buildings. So with that, here's today's show. Good afternoon and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm Ryan Willard and I'm here today with Oliver Cook. Welcome, Ollie. Hi, Ryan. Um, Ollie is co-founder of the practice Cook and Fawcett, which is a young practice specializing in cultural buildings. Um, both uh, Oliver Cook and Francis have got very impressive CVs, both studied at Cambridge for their degrees and Oliver afterwards went to Harvard and then found himself working at Renzo Piano and both Francis and... Are you guys reunited at Herzog and de Moon, right? Yeah, and that's right. worked on the Tate Extension and yep. other sort of prestigious cultural buildings. Yeah. And now you've kind of launched your own practice, what, a couple of years ago now? We started... I started in 2014 and then Francis joined 2015 um, because the project at the time that he was working on, which was the Blavatnik School of Government, wasn't yet finished. Right. And I wanted to stick around to finish that. So... It was a kind of a sort of delayed start as a duo, but um, yeah, from 2015 we were like up and running as a pair. Brilliant. And so, how did how did you get started? And what made you want to leave the kind of like you know these incredible practices that you're working at that people queue up around the corner to kind of get a job at? What was it? Must that's a quite a, a bold move to. I think um, uh, it's obviously it's a difficult question, but I think the. Um, the answer in a sense is that there's never kind of one reason for leaving a company like that. Mm. And for us, it was a kind of, it was a combination of things. I think um, first and foremost, joining that company as we both did straight out of part two in 2007. Yeah. You you experienced the best of those kind of companies, especially someone like HGM, where a huge amount of responsibility is placed on young people in terms of design. Mm. And so that environment when you start out is really interesting. Um, and really, you know, the, the young people in that company are really the kind of creative engine and, and the more experienced people are really kind of st- sort of curating rather than dictating. Um, as you get older in the company, and especially for us doing part three and learning more about managing practices and things yeah. like that, when you find yourselves in that kind of middle management position in those companies, um, what suddenly starts to feel a bit strange in some respects is that you're you're kind of doing all the design work you used to do, but often some of those decisions about how the companies actually run and, and your role in that become a little bit more opaque. Yeah. And so we we found part three really interesting. We found the ideas of running our own business really interesting and we were kind of looking for those sorts of opportunities and I think we realized that we were unlikely to get that in a kind of bigger company unless we stuck around for a lot longer. Yeah. Um, I think that, so that was one important reason. The other one, a, a really significant thing was geography. You know, we'd... Um, we both started in the Swiss office in Basel. We were there for sort of two two years ish, and then at different points, we both moved to London to help set up the London office for the initially for the Tate, then for Oxford School of Government, and then for the Canary Wharf job. Right, um, and yeah, and then on to other things like they're now doing the Chelsea Stadium and the RCA building and stuff like that. And I think you know, we kind of realised that to a certain extent, the London office is always is always going to be an execution office. Yeah, and so like a logical career move at HGM would have meant going back to Switzerland. Yeah. And both of us being from the UK, having that by that point studied and worked abroad, you know, Francis was at ETH for two years as well. We just felt that like for personal reasons, like you our, come our families <laughs> are here and, you know, partners are here and all that sort of stuff. And, and, and I think it was that, and, and so it was that kind of, there was a sort of slight sort of now or never mm-hmm. about it as well, you know, kind of in your early thirties and thinking the, the kind of projects that, you know, really exciting opportunities. Don't get me wrong; it would have been great to do. Um, but all projects that were that sort of five-year plus yeah. time span, which would have meant suddenly you're 
looking at starting starting a practice in your late thirties rather than your early to mid thirties, started to, that started to feel significant. Got it. Um, and then I think you know the last thing which may be kind of relevant to a lot of these questions was also just just opportunity. You know, I think um, for us, you know, we didn't have any any particular kind of platform in terms of savings or anything like that so we couldn't do a practice unless we had projects and um hgm have a, like a very black and white policy which is you know you can't do any work on your own jobs right so um for us it was more a case of like you know as you do people come to you every now and again and ask you to do things ranging from you know little extensions to things more interesting and after a certain point you get a bit fed up of turning those things away and you know and and it, for us it was like two or three opportunities where quite kind of reasonable and patient clients were willing to mm. say yeah we'll you know if, if you really want to do this we'll wait while you hand in your notice and get out of this nice. si- situation and then start so and that, but that, i think that was also made easier by the fact that um i left hgm at the point where the canary wolf job which i was so i was, I was project architect on that job and it went in for planning as part of a bigger master plan, right. which meant that um, there was going to be at least a year where nothing was happening on that project whilst the master plan kind of caught up. Um, so for me, it made sense to leave then and then, mm. and we had enough work that that would kind of pay my salary, um, you know, kind of pay startup costs or whatever. Um, and, and then by the time Francis joined, we'd kind of had a year to like build more projects and have more income and that could then afford the two of us to be full time and, you know, that kind of, and I think, you know, our, our work has always kind of grown organically like that. There's never been, there's never been a moment where we've kind of, you know, injected funding or anything like that. It's yeah. always just been going project by project and trying to build enough capital that we feel we can like hire someone else or, you know, move yeah. on like that. And so you're in a really interesting place now where you've kind of got a nice portfolio of like a lot of high end residential jobs around, around London. And you're kind of, kind of wanting to build upon your experience of working on cultural buildings and actually define your practice as a, you know a kind of like you know, working on on cultural and art museums and um and working with that kind of clientele how are you going about doing that and how are you finding that transition from kind of working with the private residential clients to commercially based clients and clients who are working in the cultural sector i mean i think in a way the um the 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 transition that was more difficult was going from larger commercial and cultural projects to the kind of to the private residential stuff you know going from you know working on something like the Tate where the client is you know multi-headed lots of different people yeah. lots of fiefdoms you know all all amazing people but you know very kind of interesting client structure mm. um where decision making is a sort of very multi-layered hierarchical process going from that to you know our first projects which were people's extensions and stuff where yeah. you know, you're sitting around a kitchen table you know it's the kind of classic meta- classic cliche sitting there you know late at night after people have finished work making decisions about their projects and um, um so i think that yeah that was at first a bit of a shock and it was some but it was something that we kind of enjoyed having gone from this like let's say sort of hierarchical decision making to like having that very direct relationship with with our clients um so for us now to be looking at like other things, you know, more cultural things and stuff, I think um, in a way it's sort of back in a sense to kind of what we're more familiar with, yeah. um, um, which is which is great. Um, but it's also like, it's also quite nice to kind of have both in that I think, um, you know, I think to be honest, all projects at all scales, it's like you've, you've got to be really clear that there's like someone client side and an architect side who's really driving the project forward, mm. you know, that... that you know, ideally, even on the you know the biggest projects with the most complicated client groups, you still need one person who's really the client who's like pushing it. So, in a sense, like that experience of working on people's houses and stuff, I think is really useful in terms of like how we then now approach it. Even you know commercial jobs, cultural jobs, and stuff where you know you you might be kind of inclined to think, oh, this is a cultural institution, but actually, there's probably always one client or one or two people who are really key. And, yeah, um, and they've got main concerns, and you're trying to address those through exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah, that kind of that sort of um, template of like trying to work out like what that client's key drivers really are. Yeah, you know, the drivers obviously on a residential project will be wildly different from on a cultural project, but mm. it's still understanding that those drivers are there and what they are is kind of key, I think, to yeah. understanding. It tells a little um, bit about the work that you did uh, in in Peckham with um, Bold Tendencies and, and the client there. That's quite that's quite a, a sort of, seems like quite a key project that you guys have just recently completed. Um, absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's... And um, it's kind of really sort of 
shaping the direction of your of your yeah. practice yeah so like um i think really key in terms of exposure um key in terms of the kind of narrative of our practice and kind of keeping this theme going of the fact that you know our experience is in cultural buildings and we want to kind of keep that going um and also um also i think key in terms of like the kind of work we want to make um Interestingly, you know, like coming back to this question about like the relationship between the residential stuff and and the cultural stuff, um, I think that we we were taught a really valuable lesson with the Peckham project, which was that um, I think we were looking at our projects in a very kind of um, sort of tight definition of different building types. But then we, in our first year, we made a Christmas card with one of our houses on the front of it, mm. um, and and just very um, sort of um coincidentally sent it to our who the lady who's now our client in peckham and what was interesting was that she didn't see it as a house she just saw it as a kind of cool facade on a building in islington and right, okay. and and from that was talking about oh yeah it'd be interesting to do something like that as a way of kind of giving our gallery a bit of a kind of lift um and it was a really interesting lesson in that idea of like not to be too focused on necessarily what a building is in terms of your kind of narrative but like but it being more about like what was the kind of achievement of each building. So yeah. like, you know, for that project in Islington, getting a metal facade on a building in a conservation area surrounded by listed buildings and stuff and making this quite simple kind of expression actually has like gone on to like enable the conversation with the gallery owner about mm. the performance space in Peckham. So and probably actually hasn't got us any residential work. So, you know, it's it's kind really, of yeah, yeah, amazing. I mean, um and it's always interesting as well how how like unexpected that yeah. kind of communication yeah. is like if you're putting things out into the world, if yeah. you're kind of communicating, even if it's something as simple as a as a Christmas card yeah. with your kind of branding on what you've accomplished yeah. on it, like it it activates something else in someone else's mind and then there's a project. Definitely. And I think that's a, I, I mean I'm conscious we didn't really finish answering that last question, but the um but I think for us, um a really important question in this our kind of like starting our kind of third fourth ish year of work um we've never really done any advertising we're yeah. kind of thinking that like now as we're kind of growing like we need to be a bit more kind of proactive about how we kind of engage with an audience but it, for those reasons that you've just stated it's a super difficult thing to do you know as soon as we make a kind of specific conclusion about a project and say this is why this project is interesting and this is what you should take from it we're probably excluding lots of other opportunities where someone else might just see it and have their own view on it and their own take on it um and with the Peckham work, I think what's really nice is that from that house project through the orchestral wall that we did first. So just explain um, for the people yeah, who are listening yeah. who might not be familiar with the sure. project what, what the project actually is. Sure, it's... yeah. Um, so um, the the project is for, um, well, there's several projects and they're, they're, they're for an organization called Bold Tendencies in Peckham who um, about over 10 years ago now, um, a lady called Hannah Barry, who runs Hannah Barry Gallery and also runs Bold Tendencies, um, was interested in finding a, a temporary venue to show sculpture in London. And through, and I'm, I'm a bit hazy on the details, so some of this might be wrong, but that in principle, through kind of conversations with Southwark, she was kind of made aware of this abandoned car park structure in Peckham, right. which um, was built for a Sainsbury's, which never happened. And so a car park that was built in the 80s, which is in quite good condition, was never really used. Um, and so uh, as a sort of experimental venture, they kind of took a, a short lease on two levels of the car park, um, built a very successful first project, which is Frank's Campari Bar with practice architecture. Um, that then became a real kind of attractor, um, creating kind of, you know, really impressive visitor numbers. Um, and as part of that a kind of program of commissioning sculpture, visual art, and now classical music and architecture has kind of been built yeah um and as that program has has developed and become more well known and as bold tendencies and as an organization have become more interested in the kind of commissioning side of what they do they've started to look to architecture both as something that they could commission in a kind of positive and productive way but also as something that will like um add useful infrastructure to their site so they don't do um uh, they don't really like kind of temporary pop-up type things. What they're really interested in things that like every year they could kind of add like, almost like another string to their bow in terms right. of like enhancing what they can offer. Yeah. And for us over the last two years, what that's meant is two projects. One which was um, 
on the kind of one of the lower levels of the car park, a kind of new visual and acoustic lining, which enables bowl tendencies to host classical music. Yeah. Um, and now more recently on the, on the rooftop level, um, a kind of observation deck, which has been called the Peckham Obser Observatory, um, which is about kind of providing a new perspective on the view and on, and on artworks installed on the roof and also kind of creating a sort of flexible event and performance space. Um, so for example, there's part of the kind of classical music series this summer, there were points where music was being played kind of on the deck and under the deck and it's kind of a nice process that they're going through at the moment, which is sort of understanding, you know, whether, you know, if they, if they looked at, for example, a theatrical performance or something mm. like that, would the deck be a stage or would it be a kind of seating area? Or, and, and, and so what's kind of interesting about working with them on these projects is, is this idea that there's a kind of commitment to infrastructure, which is useful. Um, but which can then like lead to being interpreted in different ways. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of yeah. That's what, what we've been doing this summer. So that's just that's just closed for the summer, but we'll reopen again next year in May. I and think. and how are you using that project now to start new conversations? That's. Um, so I think so you've, you've, had, you've you've been quite active in having events around it and yeah, having kind yeah. of you know uh, being engaged with the media and yeah. kind of starting a starting a dialogue around around the project. So for us, a, a really important question for our practice, I think, um, and, I, and I think this is, this is something that probably every, almost every new practice will say, um, if they're interested in doing public work, is, is that the barriers to entry in that sector are still huge. Yeah. Um, in particular, this, this um, uh, interest in, in showing kind of very... It, and we think in a, in a very kind of simplistic way, showing track record, you know, the kind of thing, you know, if you haven't done four of these that are exactly the same before, you won't get number five kind of thing, um, which is obviously, I think, a hugely limiting factor in terms of involving lots of young creative people in, yeah. in interesting projects. It's kind of gone on the days of the sort of Pompidou Centre yeah. style competition. Exactly. But also like no, no attempt, for example, to replicate things like the Swiss system where, you know, pretty much every public project has a competition and they'll on most of them there'll be a kind of requirement to have a certain number of wild cards of new practices and stuff right. like that so that even if the work isn't ultimately going to those practices it's still an opportunity for exposure and you know and there's a lot of kind of and in terms of how the thinking of those practices evolves the fact that they're even able to participate is really useful as a kind of creative engine in the practice yeah so we were interested in the working with bold tendencies for several reasons along that line firstly firstly was that like we want to kind of be able to demonstrate that track record and we want to kind of keep this strand of cultural projects kind of alive and kicking in our practice um and um we also think that you know organizations like Vol tendencies are few and far between and amazing in the sense that they really do commission projects you know that these projects happen um, mm. and they're not you know yet another speculative design that doesn't go anywhere it's it you know it can be it can be quite hectic and quite intense at times but you do kind of know that once you start working on these things that they're going to be delivered and there's going to be something to show for it um and i think what was interesting coming back to your question what was interesting about the the dialogue with them with both projects was an a kind of acute awareness on both sides that for us um there was value in in doing the project because the projects were interesting but also because of this sense of like getting your kind of foot in the door in this kind of market yeah um and and having the opportunity to work in that market um you know for them they were really interested in the idea of like you know just how do you go about commissioning young firms and what's the kind of what's the working relationship like and what what kind of level of support do those firms need and you know if, if you were kind of intent on offering those opportunities what responsibility goes with that yeah and it was very open and very positive conversation the whole way through and i think we felt on the back of that that was that, a that was the conversation they were instigating. Yeah, they, yeah because they because, they, because I think you know there. If you think about what's interesting is if you think about it from the perspective of an organisation who are used to commissioning artists. Yeah, they in their head they 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 consider that you know that that's very much like an opportunity they offer. So you know they want to know that they can find an artist they can offer an opportunity which is provocative and interesting. Yeah, they can then support that artist to deliver that thing. It will then be a success. And that they'll be then be part of that artist's trajectory, and it'll be clear that you know, as a kind of collective collaboration, that's yeah. been a positive thing. And it's really interesting seeing people with that mindset coming to commission architecture because they kind of approach it in the same way, um, and and also have a very clear respect for you know having discussed a brief and having discussed ideas and stuff like that. A really clear um, ambition to really help 
help you realize something in in its kind of clearest way which yeah. is really great you know so um and i think um so yeah anyway c- kind of coming coming out of that conversation which had been between us and them we thought well this is a really good opportunity to address something else which we were kind of conscious of which was that we just felt that as a small practice as a new practice um there's very little opportunity to really engage you know it's interesting kind of having this conversation but like there's there's very little opportunity to engage with similar people in similar practices yeah. having similar challenges other than in like the most kind of competitive sense you know yeah. you might you might see competition actually for the same building but you won't get, really get a chance to talk about it or do any kind of show and tell or anything like that yeah and you kind of want to know the behind the scenes yeah. of like yeah, well yeah. how are you guys actually you know how's the business working to allow exactly. you to, yeah. to produce the competition how are you kind of what's the you yeah know, the sort of structures that you're using to for sure for sure and and so we um uh and we we worked with um uh rob fine who's a kind of architectural um uh, publicist over the summer to kind of help launch the Peckham Observatory and so we were talking with him about this idea as well and we kind of settled on this idea that we would try to hold an event kind of co-hosted with Bold Tendencies where we'd invite right. you know initially it was it was almost a sort of us Bold Tendencies Rob sitting down and saying like okay who who do we think is in a similar sort of boat who's you know practices that might be a bit ahead of us practices might be a bit behind us practices that are on a kind of level who might share these same experiences who would be interested in having a kind of sort of you know kind of um sort of convening to kind of discuss discuss these things and then bold tendencies were really helpful in that they kind of they sort of extended that invite to a sort of limited audience of people in the arts world as well to kind of get involved and to to kind of participate yeah um i think i mean i'd say like you know we really knew at this sort of stuff and it was pretty haphazard and it was you know it was an afternoon of presentations in hannah barry's gallery and um i think everyone enjoyed it and it was it was good but I, like, we were already kind of thinking like if we do this again then you know, there's ways we might structure it differently or try to make it more thematic or something like mm. that um i think you know for, for most people there it was the most the most interesting thing was just the variety you know that like this kind of sense that like there's no right answer there's no particular project that is the kind of you know the kind of holy grail it's yeah like everyone was kind of doing interesting stuff and making progress and you know there was a big kind of spread um it was also really interesting you know people like carl turner were there so you know he, he might be interested to talk talk to about this as well um and he was very much one of the more kind of experienced end of people there he his, his a lot of his presentation was about his projects in Peckham, and I think there you know the interest was this kind of crossover between having a lot of people in the room who in different ways are kind of mm. trying to kind of you know, breathe more life into that parking structure. Um, so yeah, it was it was interesting. Um, and so it's really really fascinating. Listen to this, and I'm quite interested as well to sort of like you were talking about this the transition actually being more more difficult going from working on the large culture projects to residential projects and now you're kind of coming back into working with these cultural institutions or kind of you know the galleries and things what did you pick up from working you know with your clients that are in the private residential world that has been really kind of beneficial like how you've structured your practice because you were saying earlier about how you've kind of started to structure your practice where you've kind of got part of part one arm sort of looking to go into this new sector of, of cultural buildings and then another part which is kind of looking focusing focusing on the residential uh, residential side of stuff and delivering those projects um so i think well i think yeah we're we're still very small you know we're six people we might be we might be seven in the next couple of months and um so it's a bit premature i guess to talk about like real divisions in the practice between yeah. who, who does what but i think what maybe the best way of kind of answering it is that we we very much want to kind of um kind of curate as far as we can the the work around sort of different themes so that this kind of cultural theme is super important to us um education something we haven't really been able to get back into yet but lots of kind of conversations ongoing about that but in, in particular because of Francis's role with the Oxford School of Government that's something we think we can we can kind of offer our services in um and then the the private residential work um has has been kind of super interesting for us over the last over the last few years i think you know it's it in many ways we don't in many ways we see that as being a a fairly consistent thing in the practice i think um 
you know, to kind of deal with the sort of the sort of very practical side of it, um, the the time span of those projects tends to be relatively quick. You know, yeah. that's probably not how private clients see it. You know, it feels like jobs go on forever. <laughs> but like, but in in terms of how our business works, you know, the yeah. things like the kind of typical lead time between an inquiry through to actually being working on a project and being paid to work on a project and stuff tends to be quite at least predictable, if not quick. Um, how, um, how, how have you, how have you, because you were talking about earlier about, about ways that you've kind of learnt which are the right kind of clients to sort of work with or, you know, strategies that you've got from sort of, you know, do you, do you tell a client all everything up front or do you, you kind of talking about actually you started pitching work in maybe smaller bite-sized chunks to sort of see if there's a workable relationship there, a kind of way of qualifying your clients to make sure that there's a, a sort of the, the best working relationship well, I think I think you. I mean, for us, certainly, we you kind of transition from a scenario. Certainly, when you start out, partly because you know you're. I think you know, like when you, for me, like starting the business, like a big kind of hump to get over was like, am I going to get any work? You know, that sort of sense. Like, okay, I've got enough. I've got a project or two projects, and that's going to pay the bills for the next few months. But like, what then? And I think probably that first year the kind of big lesson was like, okay, yeah, we we can get the work. You know, that seems to be okay. Like we're making somehow, you know, we're making the, the money side of things work. Um, and then gradually, you know, you start to realize the thing, which I'm sure any any architect who's been in practice for a while will tell you that actually like, you know, it's not about getting the work, it's about getting the right work. Um, yeah. And and so like trying to be more conscious of uh, of making sure that projects are the right fit in terms of what you can offer, I think is, is, is uh, an interesting focus. Um, and I guess, um, you know, for us, um, it's, it's a tricky thing. I mean, I think you were asking earlier, you know, what, you know, what you, what we learn about what we've learned from private clients that we've kind of brought into like the kind of more cultural things and commercial things. I mean, I think like kind of empathy is sort of up there is like the kind of number one thing. And, and I, I mentioned that now in connection with this, this question in that, um, I think, you know, you, that it's so difficult that relationship between you know as we were saying earlier that that relationship between someone who has never done this before yeah. who is spending more money than they've ever spent on anything probably ever will again you know unlikely you know i don't know how many projects on average people do in a lifetime but you know, most people probably do one at most you know so the chance that someone's ever done it before or going to do it again are going to be slim you know, throw that person into a room with an architect who is an expert in their field, knows all the problems, pitfalls, risks, challenges, opportunities, potentials, you know, the good side, the bad side, everything. I think you know, what we're kind of finding is that there's a real, there's a real challenge in that moment that you, that you don't just go into kind of like information overload and just, and that that kind of process of like sort of enlightening or and that sounds a very patronizing word, but like nurturing, nurturing a client to, to like, to kind of, see you know the good and the bad and kind of plan for it and understand how it's yeah. going to go it can just be such a kind of complicated conversation you know like we were getting when we started out we were getting to the point where like our, our initial proposal letters were running to like four or five pages just we felt there were so many kind of caveats and things we had to put in there to kind of forewarn people properly yeah what to you're, you're still doing the sort of part three kind yeah, of like yeah, i've got to get this and, and and the challenge is it's like you know it's it's when you do that it's not it's not that you do you or don't you say it? It's like how how to communicate it in the clearest way at the right point. And you know, and, and another architect who was like a sort of mentor figure to us, who was kind of refers to like the come to Jesus moment, like you know, whatever that time span is into a project where you sort of say, you know, this is all going great. It sounds like we're on the same page. There's some lots of great ideas here, but we just do need to have a meeting where we just go through like all of the kind of this sort of you know the kind of more practical stuff which you need to be aware of. And I guess that's one way of doing it. I think. Yeah. And, and I suppose where what we were sort of what we're kind of mulling over at the moment is we've kind of got into a way of working where we always try to encourage clients um to 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 simply make a start you know i think we sort of try and say that actually more often than not you'll find that like that initial design work whether it's kind of committing to like a, a little kind of sketch phase or something like that is almost certainly going to be valuable in one way or another, mm. even if it's just about ruling out options or ruling in options or making you aware of things you didn't know about and stuff like that. It's always going to be helpful. Um, but above all, it will be helpful just as a way of like starting a conversation and as a sort of breaking the ice on something that otherwise feels like a kind of huge mountain of stuff you don't know. Um, and and I think you know, we we think it's also like a really productive way from both sides of kind of testing the working relationship. You know, if you're if you're into a kind of sketch phase and someone's really a client's really enthusiastic about it and asking for other options, you know that 
they're going to be the client kind of client who's really going to want to invest time in design. If, yeah. if you're into that sort of thing and someone's saying, you know, well, come on, why can't we just like finalize this and submit for planning? You know, then it's a very different kind of client profile. Um, and I think we sort of always try to encourage people to, to do that because like then so much of the rest of the process becomes clearer. Otherwise you can find yourself in a kind of, you know, very kind of complicated back and forth about what's involved at every stage and all this kind of thing and what you're doing when and stuff before you even really know yeah. whether that's what someone wants or whether, you know, whether it's what you want. You know? Yeah. Um, so I think that's, I mean, we were talking earlier about um, this kind of idea of how you, how you sort of establish best fit with, with clients. And I think, you know, one thing that's probably most architects go through is a kind of learning curve is like that, that point where you sort of say, actually, you know, it's not about, you know, it's not about us necessarily need feeling that we need to do everything and needing to kind of control the world in terms of doing every job that comes through the door. Um, but it's really about like, you know, working out if we're the right person and if not, maybe suggesting to that client that there are some other people we know who they could use or that there's a different way of doing it or, you know, who the builder to talk to is or that yeah. kind of thing. Um, and a, an, an idea we're sort of thinking about at the moment is whether we try and, now that we've got a bit of a kind of head of steam in terms of built work, we try and use those projects and a sort of like a kind of um, uh, sort of you know ebook or something as a way of kind of explaining a bit more about our process, so that as as people kind of already come to talk to us for the first time, they're also they already kind of know to a certain extent that they're kind of into the mm. into the idea of the way that we work um, and see value in that. Because I think you know ultimately you know what we've kind of learned is like you know you're not. If if someone isn't going to see value in in an architect who wants to kind of help them get the most out of their property, then it's, not going to it's work. unlikely that we're ever going to change that opinion. Yeah, you know, um, it will just mean that I'll, I'll, either we do something where we feel we haven't been given, able to give it enough time, or an, a, a client feels like we're messing them around because we're looking at options they're not interested in. Yeah, you know? um, so that's kind of you know I suppose where where we're at at the moment. But it's you know it's yeah I think any kind of resi stuff it's private resi stuff it's all it always feels like a bit of a work in progress because it's so personal yeah and you don't know that and it really is about that relationship yeah, with, the, yeah, with the client yeah. and it's kind of um, it's interesting talking about relationships i i just want to ask you a little bit about what makes just sort of to finish up on what makes the relationship between you and francis work because i'm always interested as well like you know you're working you're working as a jew you guys have known each other for for quite a long time uh, is it a, is it like a really complementary set of s skills that you've got? Like he's really good at these types of things, and you're really good at this type of thing, or you know what makes it what makes it a successful relationship? Um, I think so. Yeah, we so we we've known each other a long time. We met in two thousand one or two thousand or something. So and then have you know, kind of our paths have kind of crossed at different stages. Um, you know, even prior to being at HGM, where we've kind of you know that, since then we've really worked together for a long time. Um, I mean, this, this question of like complementary skills, I think is really interesting. Um, uh, I think, you know, quite often I'm a bit, I'm curious when you, when you see um, sort of founding partners or founding directors or, you know, however a company is structured, you know, people who've set up a company together where they, they, they duplicate each other's skills. You kind of yeah. wonder like, is this just a case of extra hands being useful? And I can see that like when you start a company, there there probably is a lot of that, that actually, you know, like architecture companies in their infancy, they might only just be the directors. There might not be any people involved. So like in that sense, having people who are kind of good at everything, that that kind of mold, I guess, a lot of, sort of directors fall into. And to a certain extent, we we have that flexibility and that like we don't, there aren't areas of the business that one of us can do and the other one can't. Um, but, um, you know, and for example, like, you know, client relationships are a kind of good example of that you know that we have a fairly even split across all our projects in terms of like which which of us is leading in terms of that relationship um i think um we that that said we do kind of have have kind of com slightly complementary skills in terms of like our particular experiences and things like that um francis has spent more time than i have um in in the kind of like technical delivery stages of projects, yeah. you know, um, certainly with things like the Oxford School of Government. I mean, you know, having been project architects on that building, you know, he's really like really close to the kind of delivery side of things in that. And then in, in that sense, what was a kind of, you know, kind of very complex design and build delivery scenario. Um, and I think, I mean, it's a bit of a cliche, but like, you know, I, I went to art school before architecture. Francis did engineering before architecture. In, in to a certain extent, that bears out a little bit in terms of our right. kind of sensibilities. Like, I suppose, you know, his 
his instincts pay potentially slightly more technical than mine yeah. and um, and I suppose mine slightly more on the kind of conceptual side um and but but I think the important thing for us in in starting a practice was that w- it was it's always been intended as a kind of in terms of the kind of design drivers for the practice has always been a very collaborative thing you know so I think you know it's interesting what about, what about the business skills Are they kind well of I think it's interesting as as we kind of as we're sort of growing we're kind of have, trying to ha- well we're sort of having that conversation as a sort of as quite a kind of li- live topic in that um, you know you you start to think in sort of practical terms and the kind of in sort of division of labour and stuff it's it's obviously that you st- you you run into situations where it doesn't make sense for both of you to do everything. It doesn't make sense for both of you to go ev- to every meeting. Um, you know, we have total trust and confidence in each other. So certain types of decisions, it doesn't matter in a way which one of us makes them. Just what, what matters is that they're made and we make progress. Um, and I think, you know, out of that, we've sort of naturally divided certain things in certain ways. So, you know, just over the course of the last summer, for example, or the kind of sort of press and sort of public facing stuff about the Peckham project for yeah. example has mainly been my responsibility um you know at the same time um some of the kind of more sort of like financial management side of the company has ended up being like stuff that Francis deals with on right. a kind of day-to-day <coughs> level um I think and I think as we as we grow I think that's that's a really kind of important conversation to kind of keep live I think the thing that we're really clear on and I don't, I don't see any reason why it would change. Is, is that like design is something that we want to kind of completely share responsibility for? Um, and so, in terms of like how we're trying to kind of um, sort of create and manage a kind of office culture, it's like we don't env- envisage a scenario where you know, for example, like if I, th- I think a kind of realistic, um, a realistic future for our office in the next few years is that we'd really like to have. Um, sort of like anchor projects in a couple of sectors around which we can kind of build our work. So yeah. you know these sort of Peckham projects is like is a starting point towards that. The the commercial project I showed you in Pimlico is a kind of start of like that kind of more commercial sector. Yeah. If we could add a kind of educational project to that, that would feel like a kind of comfortable sort of thing. What when when we talk about that, the thing we absolutely don't want to do is then find that you know one person is only responsible for those pro- that project and one's only responsible for that project yeah you want to keep the conversation yeah because i think you know we want to keep the conversation going and we see the kind of merit of like having that dialogue between different types of work and stuff and and so that that conversation between me and francis being kind of jointly responsible for all design work in the office um is absolutely at the heart of that brilliant um, um that's great Excellent. No, that's been that's been really really fascinating talking to you, Ollie. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, my pleasure. And uh, yeah, look for the chance more. Yeah. Thank great. you. Bye. And that's a wrap. To discover more about the process for creating a better firm with less fires and more fun, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar. On that page, you'll be able to register for my upcoming free online training on how to create a firm that empowers your staff and is set to scale without chaining you to your desk. To discover how to market your firm to win better projects, sign up for my next free design firm marketing training at architectwebinar.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core, the all-in-one firm management software. Core helps you manage your projects and your finances to create a profitable and impactful firm. Get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world.